We're there. Okay, this is fun because everybody gets to see me. <laughs> okay, we're live. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Trinity's not here. This is why it was just an, an awkward little live introduction moment. But okay, um, this is Unravel Talks Bible Study. I'm back at my table. Um, I want to welcome you. I want you to plug in. I want you to get your Bible. I want you to get. Um, Get yourself away from the kids, from, from whatever it is that's distracting you, so you can play in with us right now. I guarantee you that you will learn something. You will learn something tonight, and, and hopefully it'll be helpful. And, um, and also, if you're ever in the La Feria, San Benito, Harlingen area, you are more than welcome to join us. We have dinner, we have discussion, just come. And you will find all the details, all the details on that on the page where you're watching us from. They're there, and we're like constantly giving you the address and where we're located and all of that. Because we go from place to place. We're like the Bible gypsies. So I want to encourage you to, to be part of the group and join us. Now, if you're too far or for some reason you just can't, you just can't, you know, sickness or, or what have you, this is the second best thing. So, but watch it through so that you are learning and you are growing because that's what the Christian walk is about, that we grow, that we not stay the same. So I want to encourage you to do that. We're going to start with Proverbs 10, and we are finishing number 16. One thing I didn't mention is Shania, Shania uh, is hosting tonight. I'm super excited. She got um, her uh, new apartment, and she has a little home with her babies, and she just really uh, had a spread for the, us and made really good food, and we're so thankful. So thank you, Shanani. Okay, so now we're going to go to Proverbs 10, because we do a little bit of Proverbs 10, uh, I mean a little bit of uh, Proverbs, and then we go into the, the, the meat, the pork loin. Okay, so that not that the problem is really, I mean, there's a lot of treasure there too. So let's see. Okay, Proverbs 10, verse 19. And we'll have uh, Miss Honda, can you help me read Proverbs 10, 19? And then Susan, I think both your translations are a little different, so it'll be good for both of you. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever retains, restrains his lips is prudent. Okay. Transgression is what? Say it again. Is likely? Is not lacking. Is not lacking. Okay, lacking. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Proverbs ten nineteen. Yes. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but... He who restrains his lips is wise. Okay. All right. So this one <laughs> speaks to us all. This is uh, anytime it's about a mouth, right? It's a woman <laughs> scripture. <laughs> okay. So the Geneva Bible says, "In many words there cannot want iniquity, but he that refraineth his lips is wise." So the cannot want iniquity having kind of you know, figuring out exactly what's going on here. Um, so what it's saying in cannot want iniquity, when you don't want something, there is what was in your uh, translation, there's no lack. You, you don't lack. And what is iniquity? We've learned this before. Iniquity, sin, right? So there's no, there's no lack for sin. Sin is abundant when we are running our mouth. That's basically what this is saying, right? But he that refrains his lips is wise. He that refrains his lips is wise. Okay, so refrain to stop yourself from doing something. It's always difficult, right? To stop yourself, to refrain is you've got to have that self-control to stop yourself from doing something. Then we have the King James. In a multitude of words, there, there it is again, wanteth not sin. It's like just the, the words are kind of different from what you're, we're used to. But it's the same thing. Wanteth not. 
because there's no lack. No desire for you have plenty, again, of sin. There's plenty of sin in a multitude of words. But he that refrained and used the same word, his lips is wise. The Living Bible is awesome. It says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I love it. And that said, right? Okay. So, what do you think this verse is saying? What do you get from this verse? This is something we constantly have to be reminded of. And Solomon is wise in that a lot of these proverbs are about the mouth. About just self-control, taming our tongue. Be careful what you say. Be careful with your words. Okay. I want to ask you. When was the last time you put your foot in your mouth? When is the last time you put your foot in your mouth? I want to hear from you guys. Just say it. Just tell on yourself. Free up some women. Let the chains break. I did it. I did it. I did it. So what do you think? When was the last time you put your foot in your mouth? You guys are so awesome. Because I put my foot in my mouth quite a bit. The other day, okay. I tried to give parenting advice. Oh, Lord, have ah, mercy. But I, it was out of, like, the love of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> that, it had to have been. I was like, because <laughs> I'm reading a lead, I'm reading a book called How to Bring the Leader Out of Your Child. Uh -huh. And it was great information, but I just didn't finish reading it. <laughs> One of my mom friends, she's a lot older than me, she said something about her kid, and he, I don't remember exactly the situation, I didn't know she said something, and I was like, oh, well, you shouldn't do that, like, it kind of just slipped, and I was like, maybe you should try, and, oh, and, oh, she let me have it. <laughs> Amberlynn, let's go. <laughs> Clearly, we're not appreciated here. Like, you've been a mom for like two minutes. <laughs> Snake. And I hate snakes. 
And for, for him to say that, like, well, what do you mean? Because snakes, what do they do? So even, you might just say two words, but you bit hard. You, like, just went at it. And he says, you know, don't do that. Don't attack people or, you know, in that manner. You be, you're a snake when you do that. You put poison in um, in that mm -hmm. quick, quick second. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's another question. When is it most difficult for you to stay silent, even though you know you should? What do you opt for? When is it most difficult for you to stay silent, even though you know you should? When you know you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ah. Yeah. It is um, coming to Jesus is a lot of dying. You have to die to self. And so in that moment of silence and not speaking up when you're right, there's a lot of a lot of dying taking place. God's working more in your in your heart than he is in probably the other person's. So it's very important, even even if um, you know, because as women we may opt for I need to fill the silence. I need to fill the space with words, or I'm right, so I need to say it. But allowing that, you know, not not to be tempted to do that. Not to be tempted to do that. It just reminds me of like, um, I know there's a verse and there's people who have quoted the verse, but it's uh, basically remain silent and don't speak so, or else you'll show yourself to be a fool. Mm -hmm. I think that was last last week's scripture was on that too, just not being a, a fool. I think Honda, you need to give like a leadership class <laughs> on silence, <laughs> on silence, <laughs> on just being, you know, not having to speak. I love it. Your uh, your maturity astounds me. Um, uh, also, there's. Uh, as a, a chaplain, my husband got, like, one of the, the principles of chaplaincy, one of the main ministries is um, the ministry of silence. You just go and you sit next to someone who has just lost their loved one, and you are just there. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to feel like you have to fill the room with words. You are just present, and you're there, and you're quiet. And that's the, the ministry of, of presence of silence. So, okay, so lots to learn here. <laughs> and all of it, I mean, most of Proverbs is talks about words and the mouth. So we'll come back around to this, but we have to, you know, today, Holy Spirit said you need to be reminded on this. That's the verse we're on. Okay, we're on numbers, oh, number 16. I gotta get to my spot. Okay, so we are finishing tonight with number 16. It has been quite a trip. This one, as much as number 14, I think was, I, I really enjoyed this one, number 16. I really enjoyed numbers 14. But, let's see, da, 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 getting in my spot. Okay, I want to test you guys. What verse did we stay on? What was the verse that we stayed on? 40. 40. We finished with 39. 40. We finished with 40. Very good. Yes, 40. So we're at verse 41. Okay. 41. Okay. Da, 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 da. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we just give you this time. We give you this time right now. And we ask, Lord God, that you quicken our spirit to learn and absorb everything that you would like for us to learn from these last few verses, God. 
as we get to the finish line, God, let it, let it, this chapter just be solidified in our spirits. And God, remove any distractions, whether physical or spiritual, or just distracting our mind and our hearts. Father God, any any uh, anything from the outside world trying to get into this space, God. We give you this moment. We we honor this time with you, and we ask, Father God, that you help us just block everything out so that we can know you tonight. So that we can learn what you have us to learn tonight, God. We love you. We need your presence. We need you to meet us here, Lord. Father God, we need you to, to show up tonight. We need your presence. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 41 through 45. Let's recap just this chapter. <laughs> just this chapter because we're ending. So what I'm going to do is real quick, like uh, we're going to go Melba, Honda, Susan, we're just going to go down the line and you just say something that you remember from this chapter, something that stood out. It doesn't even have to be in sequence or anything. I just want you to say something that stood out from this chapter. Go for it. <laughs> on the spot. Well, what happened? We're gonna... When the ground opened up. When the ground opened up. You're going to go twice, Honda. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Melba, what, which part? Or from anywhere on there? Something that stood out. There's a lot that that you're thinking on your feet. Just like a Malcora and his disobedience. He just wanted to take, you know, mm -hmm. lead. And it wasn't for him. Okay. Wanting that position. Mm -hmm. And then Honda, another thing. <laughs> <laughs> the ground opening up, that was, yes, that was very Hollywood. What else? <laughs> what else just stands out from this chapter? You were with us through the whole thing, to the long haul. Susan, what stands out? The 250 who were carrying the incense being burnt up by God, yeah. and then the the censers they had were turned into a covering for the altar. They were made from yeah. bronze. Yeah. Well, Celinda, I know you were there just last last week, but is there anything that stood out from last week? Oh, yeah, that's when they. And he beat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. I don't know if I that. Well, that was the main part, so I'm <laughs> glad you remember that. <laughs> Miss Cindy. Which? I was going to, because I missed last week, but I do remember when Cora wanted to, mm -hmm. I guess, challenge you know, the authority. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's the main theme of the chapter, Gianna. What? I think when Susan said the censors, you know, they reuse the censors that originally mm -hmm. those people used, to, thinking that God was going to choose them, that they reuse those censors mm -hmm. and hammer them. Yeah. And um, that the, how Cora responded when Moses um, talk, wanted to talk to them, how Cora responded, and how, what was that tribe? How they didn't even want to talk to him. The yeah. ruins. Yeah. How they responded. Okay. Yeah, that was that was cool too. Uh, Should I? What about you? What stood out? Um, I think. I think what stood out the most, or that I guess I thought, was um, how there how there was a group of people who were called right. But then within those group of people that were called, there's people who were set apart. And to me, that stood out the most. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Cool. I'm glad you guys um, remembered that. So, yeah, we're at the part where, yeah, the ground opened up, the, you know, Cora challenges 
Moses, the ground opens up. God makes it really clear, this is not your position. But Moses, you know, as, as leader, like always, you know, that's what he chose. And then the 250 elders get burnt up because they're offering the wrong thing, which we have learned in Strange Fire in Leviticus with the Aaron sons offering Strange Fire. So we see a repeat with 250. This time the vessels are picked up and they're repurposed for the altar. And now we are at the point where the all of this has happened, okay? And so it's the next day, okay? All of this action, all of this like, wow, you know, the ground opening up and swallowing up people alive and uh, the burning up of people and like God's wrath just gone out just happened yesterday, just happened. And this is the next day, okay? So let's read verse 41 through 45. Rosona, can you read that? 41 through 45. The next day, the whole Israelite community, community uh, grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Have you killed the Lord's people, they said? But when the assembly gathered <clears throat> in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent, of, the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went into the front, went to the front of the tent, to, went to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord said to Moses, Get away from this assembly so I can put it in to them at once. And they fell face down. Mm -hmm. They meaning Moses and, and Aaron. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is, this stuff has just happened like yesterday. And they go up and they say, you know, that they're back at it. They're back at it. The very next day complaining and harsh accusations start flaring from the mouth of the congregation, from the Israelites, okay? Uh, first of all, I, I, I'm going to break it down, but, but I want you, did you see what's going on here in what Rosalinda just read? Can you just like say it like just, the, just what just happened, like just what she read, just like putting your own words? Can you do that? The community is mm -hmm. complaining. Yeah, complaining. Mm -hmm. Asking if they killed the Lord's people. Mm -hmm. If they're the ones who did it, right? Or they're the ones at fault? They're asking. Well, they, they're not asking. They're, they're, they're saying. saying. They're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what's going on, right? And so, go ahead. And God's presence comes so, down. Yeah. Shows up. And yep. God is there. And, and all of them are seeing it. The, the presence of God over the tabernacle. And he says, and he's like, step back so I can take, mm -hmm. get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Who is he talking to? Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron. And what do they do? They fall on their faces. Fall on their faces. Okay, so this is what just happened. Now let's, you know. So they can't see what's happening? He doesn't want them to see? He, what do you mean? So um, does he tell them to get away? Yeah. Because he's going to, he wants to. He's going to annihilate them. He doesn't and want, so he want them. Moses and Aaron to step aside so that he he's can. kill everybody. He can wipe everybody away. But they, yeah. usually, you know, they always fall face down like in reverence to him. Oh. To God's, God's presence. presence. So they oh, just I see. Fall face down. Okay. So this is the very next day complaining. These harsh accusations start flaring. Even as we become more familiar with these guys and have discovered the, you know, that their thinking is off. You know, I'm talking about the Israelites. You know, their thinking is off. Their emotions are not harnessed. Their reactions are incredulous, right? Over the top. Their behavior unacceptable. Their foolishness and ignorance dictates their words and action. We must admit that they still shock us. Like this was shocking. You know, when you read it, and know that what just happened yesterday. That was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, oh, do you remember when? No, it just happens. It, it just happened yesterday. yesterday. It, it reminds me of when Gianna, you know, I keep thinking, going back to the story when Gianna was little. And I would say, like, your dad's going to kill you. Like, just change your attitude quick. You know, she's crying. She's little. She's I, I, my thing is, like, your dad is going to be upset. 
and you know this before because he was upset with you not too long ago, so you should remember that and not want that moment to reoccur. But this is what happens in children, right? So at this point, so um, at this point, not sure if, if it's because, wow, how dare they, you know, the audacity, or if the shock comes to how similar we are to them. No matter how disgusted we are with them, when the dust of those emotions settle, we catch a glance of ourselves looking right back at us. Because the reality is that humans portrayed so far from Genesis to right now, numbers, might as well be holding up a mirror. It's from that humbling perspective that we can learn. We've got to go there. We've got to realize that because then we're not going to be able to learn. So let's learn. Moses, the greatest leader in the Old Testament, keeps showing us how to lead. He spent 40 years sacrificing, standing in the gap, working hard for people who would never do the same for him. Moses teaches us all we need to know about ministry in a nutshell. Spend the rest of your life loving people who won't love you back. That's real ministry. And if we approach ministry in that way, if we approach marriage in that way, if we approach parenting in that way, if we approach friendship in that way, if we approach life in this way, we won't have anything to complain about. Oh, uh, you mean people I give to won't appreciate it? Oh, uh, you mean my kid might end up growing up hating me in the future? Oh, uh, you mean the honeymoon stage in most relationships won't last? Yes, yes, yes. Leadership 101 by Moses. Let's look at verse 45. The end of verse 45, Moses falls on his face immediately, seeking God's mercy for the very people that have just accused him of murder. Let's go to John 15, 18 through 19. John 15, 18 through 19. And Gianna, can you read that? When you get there. John chapter what? 15, 18 through 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Matthew 5, this is Jesus talking, by the way. They're red letters, meaning Jesus is talking here. He's saying if the world hated me, they're going to hate you. Matthew 5, first um, book in the New Testament, 43 to 48. Anna, can you read that? 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on all the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you even do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your father, Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. So that, that last verse I like because it's, well, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Well, Jesus is 
saying, be perfect as my Father in heaven. You shall be perfect just as Father in heaven is perfect. But he's talking about that comes through loving your enemies. Perfection comes through loving your enemies. He says, you know, even corrupt people, corrupt politicians, they love their own family. They love the ones that love them. They love the people that love them. So that's not a challenge. But to love someone that doesn't love you, that's where the challenge is. And to greet, to say hi to, to engage with also those um, other people, you know, other people that you know, then that's simple. But to do that with people you don't know that, you know, um, you would think regarding as your enemies even before you meet them. So then he says, therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So I, I love that because it's in doing the hard stuff that you that Jesus says, you know, you shall be perfect, just as my Father in heaven is perfect. Perfect can be acquired through a life of sacrifice, dying, loving the unlovable, loving those that don't love us, loving our enemies. So... Let's go back to number 16. So that's Jesus talking, and it's so relevant to what's going on in this moment, what's going on in Moses' heart. Can you see over and over why Moses was chosen? Why Moses would say, I would have been like, go for it. I will step aside, blast them, you know? Because we come, our hearts are wicked, right? Our hearts, and, and here he chose a man who said, no, don't do it. And they had just accused him of murder. So with their statement in verse 41, let's look at verse 41 again. The people made it very clear when they said the next day, <coughs> they came against Moses and said, you have killed the people of the Lord. How blind are they? They're still saying, of the Lord. Like, didn't you see what happened? So, the people are making it really clear that they are rejecting God's choice. They are rejecting what God, you know, who God chose. For God showed his rejection for Korah and all his followers that, rebel, that rebelled in the previous verses. Okay? Let's go to 46 and 50. Ooh, we're almost there. So close. Okay, Susan, can you read 46 through 50? Yes. Okay. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it. And take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Okay, can you guys just tell me just what happened in your own words? Like just what, what Susan just read, like in your own words. What's, what's going on? What's happening? What's happening? It's not, it's, it's not, I know it's scary for you to just say it, but just say it. It's right there. What just happened? We just read it. Uh huh. Because because what 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 was what's happening? A plague took over, and then what what what's no. happening? Yeah. People died. Dying. People died. Stepped in. What? How did Moses step in? What 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 does it say? He said, "Aaron, take a censer mm -hmm. and go out and atone for the people, because the plague has already started." Okay. Okay. And how many people died? Okay. Okay. So, 
now that I, I just kind of want to make sure I'm, I'm going to keep doing that because it's reading comprehension 101. I want, I want like feedback. Like I want to make sure we're all seeing the same thing and then we'll unpack it. But it's important that we go, yes, who had us? Well, so, I'm confused because he told him, is this part of the, I'm going to get rid of him part? <laughs> this is still oh. the language. Yeah. Oh. It's continuing. Okay. The same what he just said, step aside. Uh -huh. And then they're saying, you know, okay. Moses went down. No, no, no. But the plague had already gone out. Okay? Mm. So now the right man, the man God had originally, from the very beginning, put as position of high priest, which represents who, by the way? Jesus. Jesus, our high priest, the only one who can atone for our sins. Mm. Okay? The man... So, so Aaron, the man called and set apart for atoning for the Israelite, goes to the right place. He goes to the tabernacle, right before the Holy of Holies. We have the altar of incense. Remember, we studied that. It's a gold altar. There's incense in there. He goes to that. He gets that incense. Um, the altar of incense from the holy place. He gets the right ingredients, the incense. By the way, all the ingredients in the incense represent Jesus. There's a character of Jesus in that. With the right tool, Aaron censor and moves into action. Because remember, all those 250 men, they, they had their incense going, but so did Aaron. And all of those guys melted away, and then their censors were removed, but Aaron was still standing. <laughs> Like everybody just gets burnt up and Aaron's there holding his censer. He was obviously the God's choice, right? So his censer uh, was intact and his censer was created for the very thing that he's about to do. And he moves into action. Verse 47 and 48. John, can you read that? Verse 47 and 48. Let's read it again in, in, in uh, chapter 16. So Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran unto the midst of the assembly, and behold, the plague has already begun among the people. And he put the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague had stopped. It powerfully depicts Aaron moving rapidly in his calling. When you have a calling, you're equipped. Aaron was equipped. This is what he was set apart to do, okay? So not only has God showed the rejection of Korah, no, I did not choose Korah. I did not choose those 240 uh, jokers. And he didn't choose Korah and his posse, but now is showing acceptance. So not only is he showing rejection, he's showing acceptance of Aaron and confirming Aaron's position. The first onset of rebellion was responsible for the lives of Korah, Dathan, Abiram, plus 250 elders who followed them. You know, followed them. This second wave of rebellion by the people, incapable of accepting God's judgment and final rule on the matter, cost the life of 14,700 people. Is there anything significant about the number? I yeah, I was I was um, researching that, and there are different scholars believe different things, and it just it go, it's kind of crazy. And I'm not a math person, so I just stayed away from it. Okay. But yes, if you want to look for it, yes, there is. There's always something behind the numbers. So due to one person rising up in rebellion and bringing others along with him, ultimately cost the lives of about. 15,000 people. That's like the equivalent of Laferia, all the people that live in Laferia, all the people that live in Rio Hondo, all the people that live in Santa Rosa, and then some falling dead. Okay? Or Rio Grande City in Stark County, the population is 14,517 according to the 2017 census. That whole city falling dead and then some. A significant amount of people. I want, I want to get in your head that that's a lot of people. It's important to realize just how far 
Korah's rebellion impacted many lives negatively. How badly Korah's rebellion affected the Israelites. So much death due to Korah's guiding people astray. Rounding them up, you know, rounding them up and stirring trouble and leading them the wrong way. How is this possible? Well, it happens every day. Especially when it comes to twisting God's word. Just look at how others have been led, have led people down the path away from this throughout history. Truth and uh, away from truth and into condemnation and even death. Ellen G. White. She started the Seventh-day Adventist cult. Charles Russell, Jehovah Witness. He started the Jehovah Witness through visions and what he thought, aside from the Bible, what he thought people should do. Joseph Smith, David Koresh. Joseph Smith is Mormon for the Mormons. David Koresh, Branch Davidians, Jim Jones. The People's Temple was his ministry. That's the Sinai laced punch, you know, famous for don't drink the Kool-Aid. So another important point not to miss, uh, I want you to get that, right? That it's and the deception is still happening. And the sci-fi author who made Scientology. Scien yes, forgot to add that, Scientology, yes. It's just a guy who wrote a book, the sci-fi book. And he said the money is in religion, so people, he made a religion. People made a book um, out of that, of principles and you know, religious uh, um, laws from that book, and a whole religion started, right? So all of this, they, it is still very easily, Korah's rebellion is still very easy. We saw it, we saw the spirit of Korah. As women, we see that in Genesis, but also the spirit of course alive in how there's deception and how people want to uh, move people away from the truth and twist God's word and deceive them unto the point of death. Another important point not to miss is the use of power of Aaron's censor, the censor belonging to the right man versus the other 250 censors that were not acceptable to God. Aaron's censer held the holy incense from the holy altar instructed by God to use for this was the only way, the only way to come into his presence. What does that represent? This represents how there's only one way, the right way to come to God. That is through Jesus. He is the only way um, the world will try and give you 250 ways, so many ways, but just like those censors holding the counterfeit incense, these are ways not acceptable to God. Don't fall for the counterfeit Jesus. Let's go to John 14, 6. This is the words of Jesus. Can you read that? John 14, 6. Uh, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There it is. That is Jesus saying, no one comes to the Father, to the presence of God, except through me. Remember this. Jesus always brings life, and rejection of God brings death. We have studied in the word how the incense, you know, represents Jesus from all the ingredients that compose this incense that depicted Christ. So when Aaron was standing in the gap, can you picture it? Can you picture these thousands of people, 14,000 uh, 14, people, you know, dropping dead. And there's Aaron with his incense, with his censer, one man standing in the gap. He's, there are all the dead people in front of him. And as the incense is blowing, all these people are alive behind him. Aaron stood in the gap covering them with the incense. See that? Don't you see that? That's Jesus. He, in essence, was covering them with Jesus. 
we must be in Christ. His blood that is his blood that covers our sin and cleanses us from freeing us from death and frees us from death. Also, the Bible tells us, and, and we studied this at the beginning of this chapter, is that incense is like the prayers of the saints. So lots going on here. There's a lot of uh, symbolism, a lot of things going on. Aaron standing in the gap for the Israelites, stopping death at its tracks, represents exactly what Jesus has done for us. Let's look at Hebrews 2. Paul, Paul backs this up and Paul uh, explains this in Hebrews. And Hebrews is right after 2 Timothy. <laughs> Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. 14 through 15. Mama, can you read that, please? 14 through 15. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. And that's, that's a little bit, um, can you read that again, uh, Honda? That's a good elaborate translation. I want, I want, I'm curious about what yours says, Honda, 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one he, who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. Okay. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus did. This, stay in that, that Hebrews book and go to chapter 7. Hebrews 7, 24 through 27. Um, Miss Cindy, can you read that, please? 24 through 27. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself. Hallelujah. So he's talking, remember, he's talking to the Jews here. He, he knows all, they know the Old Testament. They, they know what has happened. They know that a high priest had to make sacrifices for himself before he could even make atonement for other people. And he's saying, no, now we have another high priest. And he did it one time, and that's it. He didn't need to do um, any more sacrificing. That is it. He, is, he has done it. He is the one, the perfect sacrifice. And so here we see that this is exactly what Jesus did in Aaron's actions, he's painting a picture. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Jesus is what stands between life and death. Furthermore, Paul even teaches that our lives are to be like a fragrant incense, like a life-saving. I thought this was very cool because it's exactly what we're seeing here. Like a life-saving perfume for those lives we encounter on a regular basis. Look at 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. Second Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 17. And Shanene, can you read that please? As soon as you get there, no, 
I was gonna I was asking Jenna why why is it perfume? Well we're gonna we're gonna see how it reads and then we'll what is it, second Corinthians what? Uh two chapter two, fourteen. So people are still getting there. You're you're okay. Um okay, so the second chapter two, fourteen through seventeen. Uh, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of, of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the, one, to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For, uh, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Okay. So Paul was a genius, bless his heart, and sometimes it's hard to understand what, what's being said, right? So here he's just, he, he's talking about how our lives are, should be that sweet smelling aroma, just like incense, um, my, my dad, um, because of the, the generation right in the 70s, instead of candles, they used a lot of incense to make the place you know, smell good. So this is what he's talking about, that we are to, and this is connects back to the incense here, life-saving incense, right? That we are to be this smell, that our lives ought to be guiding people to Jesus. Like it should be a sweet aroma of life. I'm going to follow that person because they're going to point me to life, to eternal life, to Jesus, right? And this is basically what he's saying. And then in verse 17, he just, he adds this. He says, we're not selling the gospel, uh, for we are not as many. So even back then, there were people that were like salesmen for the word of God. But in sincerity... But in truth and with a pure heart, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God and in Christ. So he, he's talking about this and he's he's unveiling a lot of truth about, you know, the gospel and how, how Jesus connects. He's connecting the dots for us in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle to help the Jews, help the people who got this understand this, understand that Jesus came and he died for us but yes that's what that talks about the life-saving perfume that your life so maybe you can't give the best parenting advice but the way you treat people the way your countenance is the way you treat your children the way you love them the way you care about life and others should want her to know like i want to know about you what what is it that you do where you know tell me if something should attract them because there should be life this sweet smelling life saving aroma around you that's what this is talking about and it, and it connects here so it's just in this beautiful dramatic scene you can just picture it like i can just picture the camera like zooming like it's far away and you just see like Aaron with his sensor, you know, and all these dead bodies and then all these people behind them. And then the camera zooms in and in scene. <laughs> like it just ends right there. This chapter ended beautifully right where it needed, reminding us back where we started that we need Jesus. The gospel, it led us back to Jesus and led us back to the gospel, okay? So we ended here another chapter. Now, we're just gonna summarize it and we're gonna pray because this is awesome, we're, we're done. All of the things we learned, how many verses does chapter 16 have? 50, 50, okay. So we broke it up in 11 weeks, right? Oh. 11 sessions, 11 Bible studies. I, didn't, I never know. How, how this is going to go down, okay? It's not like I set out to, oh, we're going to have an infinite number of options. <laughs> I don't know. There's chapters that we'll just breeze through. There's some that, that, whoa. And this one had a lot of stuff. This one showed us the spirit of 
Korah, right? It showed us about the Reubenites. So it showed us about who we, the, the walking versus the running, who we walk with, who we're supposed to walk with, who we're supposed to run with. It taught, you know, it, it, it taught us that. What else did it teach us? We went through about vessels, that we are holy vessels separated for his purpose, set apart, that we're not to be prostituted. But we're not to be prostituted for the things of the world, the gifts and everything that he's put inside of us. It is for his kingdom. It is for him. Okay? And then Korah's response. We see how people respond differently. A response from Korah, a response from the Reubenites, you know? Reubenites are like, beep, 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 you know? And the and just no, we're not gonna talk to you. And Cora was like, okay, well, you know, they, they went through the motions of everything that Moses had said. We see um, just everything, everything unfolding. Moses trying to be patient, losing, you know, the last that was the last straw, the way the Reubenites talked to them, talked to him. Um we see that Aaron, we see that Aaron was chosen when he was a hot mess. When he was building a golden calf and they were having orgies and all this stuff around this golden calf. God said, mm, I'll pick that one. You know what I'm saying? It was the fact that God chooses us from even our past. Even in our hot mess. He sees what's inside of us, what he can use. And he's now, I choose that person. I choose you saw the in spite potential. of what, excuse me? Saw the potential. Yeah. What he and when you be. are chosen, when you are chosen, that you, and, and so, and we freeze up. We let our past a lot of times dictate our future. And so how, if God doesn't look at that, at the very moment he was making Aaron, a high priest, and Moses was writing it all down up in the mountain. Aaron was making a fool of himself. God saw it all, and he still picked Aaron. So that what did that teach us? What did that show us about ourselves? And then the fact that Eleazar was picking up these censers and how Eleazar represented that God is our help and and how Eleazar was still in ministry, was still in the thick of it, even though his brothers were idiots. His brothers went and made fools of themselves and God sapped them. But Eleazar was still in there. He was faithful. It doesn't matter what family you come from or what family you're born into. God God has a plan. And so all of these all of these pictures, even when Korah tried to smear this painting that Jesus, that, that God was trying to paint of his son, instead of smearing it, he just gave us more examples of this is, this is what Jesus looks like at every turn in this chapter. The censors being repurposed. That's like us when we're in our mess, when we've messed up. And he's not, oh, I can still, I, I can still, I can still, I can still, I can still use you. But you got to let some things go. You're going to get some things out of you on this altar. You're going to have to surrender completely. We, we see that. We see the goodness of God in this entire chapter. His love. We see servant leadership at its best. We see Moses teaching us over and over how to lead people. Even though they don't love him, they don't appreciate him, they're ready to kill him. So we learned a lot in this chapter. It speaks volumes at every turn. We're going we're gonna to pray and... Uh, Honda, if you can very carefully, like there's, it can just take us off live. All you have to do is go around it and take us off live. You just press that button and then press share. <laughs> I have a question.
Uh, yes, we're gonna we're gonna do questions and we do comments. The sensors. Yeah. Did each one of them have one? 